Okay. As I have alluded to previously, this is my script for this motivational life story talk that I've been working on. So I'm not promising it's going to be very slick, but I will give it my best shot. And this will serve very well for me from a timing point of view, but also it will give me a chance to get some feedback from you guys and what you think it actually sounds like. So this is basically a shortened version of my life. So I was born October the 23rd, 1971. I was a forces child. My dad did 22 years in the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. Now I was born in Datchet in Surrey. I was actually given birth on the kitchen floor. In fact, my mum gave birth to me standing up. Uh, I came out, I hit the floor, cord snapped, I slid across the floor and ended up underneath an old fashioned gas oven. I've always had a strange attraction to gas pipes. Um, from that point, I was then taken to the hospital by my Uncle Nick in his Robin Reliant three-wheeler. So as you can see, I had quite a traumatic start to my life. Underneath a gas cooker and a three-wheeler at the hospital. Surprised they ever got anywhere at all, to be honest. Um, officially, I suppose I'm a southerner. But it's Yorkshire blood that runs through these veins, so I'm continue to complain my birthright as being a Yorkshireman. Now, grew up fairly normal life, really. Um, two brothers, one eight years, one nine years older than me. Um, and apart from moving every two and a half years as my dad got a new post in, life was pretty normal. You know, parents stay together, usual sibling rivalries, nothing of any real note. Uh, home life was pretty normal. Uh, we went to church every Sunday. My mum and dad were Methodists. And that was pretty much it. Now, when I was nine, we settled back in the UK. Uh, my dad had finished his term and we came back and moved in with my mum's dad, my granddad, because uh, he was suffering ill health and needed care. Now, I did pretty well at school. I was particularly gifted at maths and maths-based subjects. Quite weird, really, because I ended up going to prison years later for VAT fraud. I was pretty good at art as well, which is something I still do to this day. I still draw. Um, and I came away from high school with 10 GCSEs, which I was quite surprised at, to be honest, because I didn't really try. So I was shocked I did as well as I did. And about 15, I started training in the cellar at home. And I'd always been a big lad, always been a fat lad. Played rugby at a school level and then a county level, but I wasn't particularly strong for my size. I wanted to change this, so I started messing around with a set of dumbbells that used to be my brother's in the basement at home. Um, I took to it straight away. Really enjoyed it. Um... And very shortly after that, I joined a gym in my local town of Huddersfield. And the gym was Bob Sweeney's Olympic Gym. And it was upstairs above Dodd's Health Food Shop on Kingsgate. Dodd's is still in the town, though it's moved. But Bob Sweeney's is a long time gone. Mum thought it was a fad. Sort of entertained it, but didn't really support it in any way, shape or form. And I remember I used to train on a Saturday and on a Saturday, I had a job at a local fish and chip shop in the town centre. I used to work in a prep room downstairs, sorting out the, the chips. So I was studying starchy, fishy water pretty much all day long. So I wrote that my trainers stunk. And I always remember the gym used to make me leave my trainers outside before I would go in. Wouldn't let me walk in with my trainers on because it smelled that bad. And, um, you know, there was something, I don't know, training just clicked with me. Uh, I was an angry kid. I had no reason to be. I don't know why. I always felt like I didn't really belong. And I always felt like I was looking for something. And training sort of gave me that. 
um, it was, I don't know, I, I, I had a thing for almost punishing myself, I suppose, almost, mass, um, you know, almost self-harming. And training gave me an outlet. It gave me somewhere where I could hurt myself. I could push myself hard. And it was socially accepted. In fact, I got a reputation for training that hard at a very young age. Most people wouldn't come near me or train with me. I was known for being very, very intense with my training. It didn't help that when I was 16, I started working at a gym called Maloney's. A gym that I trained at on and off for 27 years. And... Uh, there used to be a gentleman there called Billy Payne who used to train there who was one of Dorian's ex-training partners and I trained with Billy for a while I also trained with Kev Taylor who was a British champion and Marianne Gay who was a pro bodybuilder so at a very early age I got a baptism of fire about what intense training was and I truly believed that the only difference between me and a pro was that they trained harder than me so the only thing that was stopping me from being their size was how hard I trained I didn't have a clue about steroids. I didn't have a clue about the drug side of the sport. Um, so I got into my training, and I was passionate. I was really into it. So at 16, I got the opportunity to go to America for a year, uh, a bit like a student exchange program, but it was one way, so there was no one coming back. And I took it, and I trained out there. Um, it was... It was a good experience. I can't say I particularly took anything from it. Um, I came back and I started at Huddersfield Technical College doing a BTEC National Diploma in Art and Design. And I then started working as a bouncer at a local nightclub. I was 17. And I started working at Johnny's Nightclub in Huddersfield. It's no longer there. Uh, I always remember it had a metal dance floor, which basically became an ice skating rink. But I started working there when I was 17. I wasn't supposed to. I lied about my age, and I believe I got something like about £6 an hour taxed. <laughs> anyway, at 18, I went over to uh, the Coliseum nightclub in Halifax, which was the biggest nightclub in the area at the time, and I got a job there. I remember Johnny's, it was run by Joey and oh, Johnny Marsden. And these two just looked like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. They were two short, fat blokes. The identical twins. Funny as hell. Um, I remember when I told them I was leaving, they wouldn't speak to me. <laughs> Refused to talk to me. So I started the college here. Um, I was 18. And I was around 23 stone. I was natural. Um, 23 stone is 280, 30, 30, 30, 30, 322 pounds. Natty. Fat, but strong for a natty. Um, like I said, it was only at this point I actually became aware that steroids actually existed. I would made a mistake of thinking that weight was muscle, uh, the size was muscle. So I'm looking at these pro bodybuilders and oh, they're 22 stone, he's 21 stone, he's 23 stone. I'm bigger than them, I'm the same size. I wasn't, I was just a fat mess. It's something that I've had a problem with all my life. The, the honesty of being able to perceive what I really look like. Um, I thinking I'm small when I'm big or thinking I'm big when I'm small. Uh, thinking I'm fat when I'm not and thinking I'm not fat when I am. I've always struggled with it. I have body dysmorphia, but it's a phrase that gets coming around a lot, and it's not really, I don't have true body dysmorphia, I just have a screw perception of how I appear, a lot of us do, um, and a lot of us perpetuate this lie, with our Facegram and our Instagram, and, and all the selective shots and filters we use to put something up which really isn't us, I've got one question for you. Have you ever met anyone who looks like their Facebook profile pic? Because I know I haven't. Anyway, here I am, 23 stone, very large girl. 
I'm not really seeing myself as being fat. And I decided I wanted to compete as a bodybuilder, a natty. I was going to be a natural bodybuilder and I was going to compete. So I started dying on Easter Monday. I waited till I'd eat my Easter eggs, obviously. And I decided I wanted to compete. I stepped on stage on October the 14th at 14 stone 3 pounds, having lost 9 stone, or the equivalent of 126 pounds. The last week or two going to show I was a complete and utter mess. I remember cardio twice a day, training once a day, and I was living off Castellan and cabbage. I didn't know where I was, didn't know what I was doing. In fact, post show, I couldn't eat normally. I just made me throw up. I had to reverse diet, so I had to keep on a diet and slowly introduce normal foods. I was such an emotional wreck, crying, angry. Emotion didn't know where I was, didn't know what I was doing, and obviously I'd never died before, so I didn't really know that this was normal. But I competed, I won, and I was a junior natural champion. It meant really nothing. I thought this was going to be the answer to this yearning I had for, for being something, for being somebody. I thought I was going to find myself didn't really mean much at all no one attended on my behalf i competed on my own i was on my own and i i was quite happy for it to be that way because it really didn't strike me as anything but i was so burnt out i sort of stopped training and i obviously slowly but surely start to eat normally again and i got fat um Fast forward three months, I'm 19 stone, um, 266 pounds, chubby, still natural. Um, I returned home from the summer because I'd just moved away before, just as I competed, I moved away to Colchester to start my uh, diploma, my degree, um, and my H&D in design. And uh, I went home for the summer, got back in the gym and decided, you know what, I'm going to try gear. The natural thing didn't do it for me. I wanted to be bigger. That's what I felt I needed to be. I needed to be bigger. I needed to be stronger. That was going to give me the answers. That's what I was searching for. So I went on gear. Didn't have a clue. Didn't know what I was doing. Just took what was available, had no idea what these things did to me, had no idea how they worked, and I did that for four years. But anyway, the summer went by, I returned to Colchester for my next year of my uh, diploma, and I was nine in stone of muscle. Now with these drugs, my training had reached a whole new level of intensity. I found myself getting asked to leave gyms because I trained so intensely. I got barred from quite a lot. I got very, I was very aggressive when I trained, and I noticed people started to move away. People were scared. It intimidated people, and I got drunk on that. I got drunk on that power, um, and I started to use it to my advantage. I enjoyed my size, enjoyed my intimidation. I worked on the doors, at several raves and clubs. I wasn't a bully. But I did use my size to control people and intimidate people. I had no fear. I just didn't care. Um, combination of being young, full of confidence and full of steroids. You know, I just didn't give a fuck. I thought I was capable in any situation. And I remember I got approached by a drug dealer. Uh, he had some debts that needed collecting. Nothing major. Not big, big time stuff. But, you know, still he had some local guys that owed him a bit of money. And so I started debt collecting for him. It was a piece of piss. When I turned up, people fucking shit themselves. Um, and I then didn't give a fuck. I remember I was driving down the motor one day. Um, I was in my car, a friend of mine was in his other car. And we started messing around, trying to shove each other off the road. Just sort of messing, really. But I didn't mess. And I took it quite seriously. And I tried forcing him off the road. Well, I did force him off the road. Uh, luckily, he went up a slip road. I didn't know it was there. My intention was to ram him into the banking. That's so sort of intense and, and, and 
off the wall I was getting at this point. Um, so anyway, I'm doing this dealing. I felt no guilt, you know. I mean, these are drug dealers at the end of the day. They don't get, they get what they deserved. Um, I felt above them, which is ridiculous, but I did. Anyway, one thing led to another, and I started doing more debts, and then I was generally getting hired for it being a thug. Uh, never saw myself as that. That was the strange thing. I always thought I was a decent person. I felt that I didn't hurt anyone that didn't deserve it. No, they did, didn't they? They owed money, so they deserved it. it wasn't mine to judge judgment on, on what had got them in that situation. They owed money, so they deserved getting hurt. I lost count, the doors are kicked in, or the heads I did are the same. My reputation was growing rapidly, and I was starting to get involved with more and more serious people. And then three things happened. I finished uni. Distinctions across the board, but there was no work, no jobs in design. It was dead, it was non existent. I wasn't a student anymore, I had no job, I had no direction. At the same time, I remember doing a debt for a guy on this young lad who had nothing. And what little he had, I took off him. And I also remember at about the same time, I was walking down the street one day, and uh, the high street, and there was a woman walking towards me with two kids. I remember her looking up, seeing me, absolute fear in her face. And she grabbed her kids and, and ran across the other side of the road. Now, up to this point, I'd buzzed off the power, I'd buzzed off the intimidation, and then all of a sudden, I've got no job, I've got no student anymore, I've got no career, I've got nothing going on. And for the first time ever, a job has bothered me, and then I saw a reflection of what I was becoming in somebody else's face. That honestly was a bit of a wake up call. a massive impact on me. I remember it now. I was walking through Colchester on a Saturday afternoon. She was coming towards me. It's the early 30s, a pram, two kids with her. She saw me coming, took sheer panic and just grabbed the kids and ran. I looked around because I thought there was something else going on. And then it dawned on me, it was me. I also remember another incident. A mate of mine had uh, gone away and I was looking after his two dogs, two Roy's. And I remember I stood at the side of the pavement with these two dogs. Well, I sorry, there was no, there was a guy sat at, crouched at the side of the pavement outside McDonald's eating his burger. And I walked with the two dogs. And I was chatting to somebody, and one of the dogs pinched this guy's burger. And the guy went to say something, and I turned around and looked at him, and he looked at me, absolutely shit himself, and just got up and walked off. Too scared to even complain because of the way I looked and the, the look I had on my face. What, you know, to say anything. And it was these incidents that made me actually, for the first time ever, look at myself and see what I was becoming. Saw myself as the rest of the world did. I'd become a bit of a monster. Become a bit of an asshole, really, you know. I was a bully. Maybe not in the traditional senses, but I did intimidate people, I did scare people, and I did enjoy it. But then all of a sudden I got a conscience. I felt guilt over that last debt. I felt sorry for a lot of cleared out. I didn't need to take his stuff, it wasn't worth anything. I did it because I could, and to be honest, at the time, I didn't feel anything. And then all of a sudden I've got this massive conflict. One half of me is this power drunk egomaniac getting deeper deeper into naughty and naughty as shit violence is now a way of life the violence doesn't mean anything to me it's just what I do and then this other side is this guy who's deeply troubled by what's going on and what he's doing and suddenly become very self aware and conscious of how he's viewed it wasn't long after this I came back up to Yorkshire I had an out. 
nothing on, was on my arse. Uh, I was too proud to go home and say I'd messed up, so I ended up sleeping rough. I ended up breaking into a place called the Bailey North East Labour Club. A big working men's club had been shut down. It was up for sale. Unknown to me, there was a living security guard. He wasn't there at that time, he'd gone out on the piss. I've settled down, made myself a bit of a bed in a corner, gone to sleep. Got woke up the next morning, about five o'clock, by this drunk security guard so I'm banging and bashing all over the place. Um, the last thing he expected was to find me. Um, it was quite weird, actually. He was from uh, Newcastle. He was, he was a sound bloke. We got talking, uh, and basically he looked after me, let me stop there as long as I covered his ass and he could go home at weekends and stuff like that. So it worked out really well. It gave me a roof over my head, gave me some food in my stomach. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then uh, the club soon reopened. It was sold. Uh, it reopened. And um, I managed to get a job behind the bar. Started doing a little bit of money. I was still sleeping at the place. Uh, one of the spare rooms upstairs. Um started getting a bit of money, uh, went out and bought myself a white shirt, some black trousers, black shoes, and went back working on the doors. Um, I met a girl, moved in with her. She didn't like me working at the clubs anymore, so I got a proper job. Uh, I hated it. I hated my employer. Uh, apparently, I held the record for the person that stayed out of this place the longest. Most people lasted two, three days. I lasted about four months. And then I got a job in a foundry. Um, I was banned from driving at the time, so I used to get up at quarter past two and ride 25 miles to work every morning to start work at 5 a.m. I worked hard uh, and worked my way up to forum, foreman, then quality control manager. I did my ISO 9002 auditors course through the company, fault of truck license through the company, and it was going quite well. Um, I ended up splitting with my girlfriend. And I went back on the doors. Now, I'd bought a house at this point. And, um, slowly but surely, I was getting a reputation for a good doorman. And I was starting to get people asking me to supply doorman. Uh, and as a result, it wasn't long before a manager approached me and asked me to run her door staff. And that was my first contract. Uh, and I remember I used to work at um, a rave club uh, called KU Club on a Sunday night in Huddersfield. And the night was called The Industry. Uh, and I remember sat there at home trying to think of a name for my company. And I looked up and saw the jacket sat there and hung up on the back of the door. And I was like, the industry security services. And that was my agency. Fast forward four years and it is the third largest door security company in the UK with a turnover in excess of four and a half million. And we had more contracts than any other company because we mainly did pubs and not nightclubs. We didn't have the, the same volume of staff of the big two, which was Leisure Sec and Bridgegate. But we had over 800. And we had a one bulletproof reputation. We were regarded as one of the best there was. Uh, in fact, we were the biggest single supplier to Scottish and Newcastle. We were brand suppliers to a lot of venues. And we were the, one of the early companies that started getting national branded contracts. So much so that when the SIA, the Security Industry Authority, was formed in the UK, I was seconded by Molly Meacher to sit on the formation committees. They didn't listen to a fucking word I said. Went and did their own thing anyway and completely screwed the, the industry. But at least I was there. Um, anyway, by this point, I've left the founder. I got burnt out, couldn't do the hours anymore, and I was focusing, obviously, solely on the security company. And it was going quite well. Now, at this point, I'm King Dick again. I'm banging heads with a lot of naughty people especially the Manchester gangsters, a couple of the London boys. But 
because of the size of the company. They're not really wanting to play. And we're having meetings and we're making deals and things are getting sorted. You see, if I had a problem with Mickey Francis or Damien Noonan or Paul Massey or Paul Flannery or any of the Richardsons in London or any of these other naughty people, I'd go see them, we'd sit down and it was business. And it was like, you keep your knobs out of my venues and you can come in. And that was it. Um, and generally, they agreed. In fact, I remember how I met Damien, it's quite funny. Um, and this isn't a story of bravado, this is the story of stupidity. I took a bar off him, a uh, late bar in Stockport. He lost the bar because his dormant were dealing drugs. Now, um, he, um, the, I did work for the company that owned this bar, so it just got slotted in with the area that I was already doing, along with quite a bit of other work I picked up off him at the same time. So Damien rang me screaming and shouting down the phone how I'd taken his contract off him uh, and I was going to pay him the profit out of it. Now, I'd heard of Damien Noonan. Um, he was one of the big heads out of Manchester, but I didn't really know him. And my response was, fuck off, you daft prick. You lost the door, not me. I haven't taken it off you. I've been giving it because you fucked it up. So you can fuck off, you're not getting the money. Bollocks to you. That was the end of the conversation. At that point, Damien smashed his office up. Uh, at the time, he had a guy called Matt Lund working for him, who me and Matt later became friends because he was involved in the purchase of my business a few years later. And uh, Matt told me when we met later that basically Damien went absolutely mental, smashed his phone, smashed the office, couldn't believe that I'd spoken to him like that. Who the fuck was I? And then he calmed down and apparently turned around and went... You know what, that's the first person who stood up to me in years. And I gained his respect. I didn't do it out of bravery. I did it out of ignorance and stupidity. I wasn't fully aware of who Damien was. So as a result of that, he didn't mean anything to me. I think if I'd have been aware of how connected he was and how capable he was, I may have had a slightly different approach to it in later years. But I was young, I was stupid, and I was full of myself, and I was heading down the same path I'd been down before. This was Colchester, Mark II. Again, I thought I had a conscience. I thought I wasn't a particularly bad person. But the fact was, the vast majority of my friends were gangsters or criminals. In fact, unbeknown to me, the police had a very interesting intel file on me, which caused me problems subsequently a few years later. So, anyway, that was, yeah, um, the company grew in reputation, got bigger and big, bigger, the SIA came in. We paid everybody cash. I knew that wasn't going to survive the SAA. I was burnt out. I'd been stabbed in the back by a few of my key management. Um, and I needed to do something. So uh, I put it up for sale. And I got approached by a guy called John Disley. Utter scumbag, as it happens. Bent accountant, but he was acting on behalf of Damien and Paul Flannery. And they put a pelfer on the table and they bought my business. I remember shortly after that, Damien killed himself in a bike accident over in Dominican Republic, and he was airlifted to Miami. I remember we did the security for his funeral. And arranging flights and everything else before he died. The business had problems. The cash element of it was the operation, brilliant. The quality of service, brilliant. The standard of staff, brilliant. The accounts, brilliant. Sack of shit. Why? Because I didn't. I didn't have a clue. Uh, and we were growing so fast. We were expanding so massively that um, cash flow was a major issue. And I started trading off the back of the VAT. The VAT re um, returns came in. And instead of submitting them and just not paying them, which would have just been a civil issue, a debt, 
I altered them to what I could pay. The result of this was about four months later, five months later, the VAT inspectors and the armed police turning up at both my house and my office simultaneously. Um, you may ask why an armed escort? It's not probably common standard that the VAT man comes with armed response. Well, no, but then again, it's not always every business that has meetings in the middle of fucking Salford with some of the biggest gangsters in the bloody country. So, you can see where they were coming from. Um, guilty by association. And though I hadn't been involved in anything particularly dodgy, or well, not on the level that these guys were, I still associate with them. I still had a very, very large security company with a very, very successful security company. And two and two made 103 at that point. So, they turned up. They searched the house and they found five stolen cars on my driveway. Now, I knew they were dodgy, these mowers. I didn't think they were nicked. But I knew they weren't right. So here I am. Five counts of receiving stolen vehicles. One count of firearms for a shotgun that was sat on my wardrobe thing. That was a vintage antique thing that ends up getting dropped. And £504,000 of VAT evasion. Um, started going through the process and to be fair it, it was what it was i went to trial on the cars got not guilty on two and guilty on three which i thought was a bit strange but never mind how could i know that two of them weren't nick but no the other three were but anyway um and we got the vat down to 297. now at this point i've got an off on a table remember for the sale of the business a quarter of a million cash I spoke to my barrister and his exact words were they are convinced you're more than what you are your reputation is burying you here and if I were you I'd take the cash and I'd fuck off so that's what I did went to Spain um, now at this point you'd think I'd learnt my lesson you know you'd think I'd uh, settle down start a new life start fresh but i'm still not being honest with myself i'm still not seeing i am for who i really am still not seeing what i've done how i've lived my life i've got excuses for everything i'm not such a bad bloke um so when i get to spain i find there's a niche market in providing paperwork for expats that want mortgages spanish companies don't really check it you get a commission based on the mortgage. So I started doing this. But it wasn't long, you know, um, before I got a reputation for doing that. And then, shall we say, some people that earned their money from illegitimate sources approached me because they wanted to buy properties and put their money into it. So I provided the paperwork for them. And obviously, some of the contacts I had in the UK from what I was doing with the security knew these people who knew other people, and it, you, know, you can see how it all sort of interlinks. So here I am, back in the shit again. Not learnt my lesson, but I was earning money. The banks didn't really care, they just wanted to see paperwork. Um, so. I provide fake wage slips, fake P60s. These were usually sourced online. I even had a guy in the UK that would do it for me. Um, and then I say I started getting approached by people who had a lot of cash, no apparent jobs, and I was getting more and more involved. Now at this point, I hadn't trained for years, and I was a very, very fat and obese, 27 stone which is touching a 400 pound mark. I hate the way I looked and I was aware of the company I was keeping. I was miserable, depressed. I was in a very bad relationship. I felt trapped. 
I had no direction. I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I didn't know where I was going with my life. I didn't know anything. And the people I was keeping company with were getting worse and worse and worse. Um, I remember going around one of their houses one morning uh, to, I think I was picking up some cash to put in a deposit box or something. And uh, the guy was making a smoothie, of which he offered me some. Now, I was always dubious of these buggers, but he's like, he swears by there's nothing in it, there's nothing in it, it's just, it's just a smoothie. Okay. That's quite nice, to be honest. So I had some. And all of a sudden, my day got really good. I remember going to see managers and bars, and, and I remember realising, Dave, shut up, you've not stopped talking. And then I started to feel very weird. Um, very, very weird. I remember I was um, all over the place, morning calls, sorting things out, but then I started to feel anxious. Didn't feel good, I felt off. I was sweaty, I felt nervy. So I rang the gentleman who'd made the smoothie, and like, what the hell have you done to me? And he's like, nothing, nothing, there's nothing dodgy. And I'd seen him make it, so I could have been anything dodgy in it. I felt awful, my heart was pounding, I was sweating. I rang again. Uh, after a few hours, it started to calm down, so I rang again and again. And he started to press his innocent, but this time he started laughing. So I'm like, what the fuck have you done to me? He says, genuinely, didn't realise. He says, but I'd use that blender the night before, chop up a load of coke. I want to wash it out properly. So there was me, pulling my tits off on coke without even knowing about it. That was the first and only time I've ever touched that shit. Never again. I realised I was heading down a bad road. I realised my life was a mess. I realised I was very unhappy, both with myself, my relationship, everything. I just didn't know I was going to get out of it. My gut instinct was to run. Now, I've been spending a bit of time online at this point, and I got right friendly with a lot of Canadian guys who run a low rider club called Low Cost Customs. And they were out in Canada. So the plan was hatched. I started to make deals, collect cash in order to piss off to Canada. And then I made the jump. I did a deal, um, ripped a few people off to be honest to do it, um, and I bailed. I ended up flying into Canada with 250,000 Canadian dollars stuffed down my pants. That was one uncomfortable flight. Nervous as hell, I was going to get caught. But no issues, sailed right through. I got there, I'd already ordered as a rental off property. I went to the bank, I put a bank account, deposited the cash, and everything went quite well. Um, put cash in lumps and sums and bits and bats. But generally, it went really well. Um, and everything was going well, and I was thinking about purchasing a place, and we were going to, I was going to try and legitimise myself. I even went back to college and got my uh, gas engineering certificate. And, you know, though I wasn't really working at this point, and I was going through money at an alarming rate, there looked to be a bit of a future. But, again, I was just hiding. I was, I was just hiding behind the money. I, I was deeply unhappy in both the way I looked and in my relationship still. Now, previously, at this point, I've been married once. I'm actually on my second wife. Now, on my first wife, I had an affair. And the result of that affair was a little bit of illegitimate child. Charlie, my daughter. I shit myself when I found out that her mum was pregnant. And I ran away. I hid from her. It was a scumbag thing to do. And I don't think I'd ever, or I will ever, fully forgive myself for it. That shit you just don't do. But I did. So, I'm now in my second marriage. I've had no contact with my daughter whatsoever. don't know if she exists. Um... And I've just put it at the back of my mind. But I carry a deep guilt for this. A deep guilt. Uh, and this is all part of what's making me 
unhappy. I'm in a loveless relationship with a woman I can't really stand anymore, but I feel I have to stay there because I'd walked away from my daughter. We have a child to go. We have a son at this point. Uh, and I feel I have to stay. I feel I can't walk away because I did that last time and I can't do the same thing again. However unhappy I am, however miserable I am. So anyway, here I am in Canada trying to make a go of things. Bullshitting myself. Lying to myself that things are going to be all right. And I get a knock on the door. And it's one of the guys who I used to work with in Spain. It just turned up unhappy because I'd left him in the lurch. And he calculated I owed him a serious amount of money. So that money that was in the bank account went to them. Now I've got a problem. I haven't got a lot of money. I need to legit advise myself. I need to get working. I've got qualifications. I've got offer of a job. But I don't have the legal paperwork to do it. And at this point, I don't know a way around it. So I try and start to legitimize myself through um, customs. Um, and I apply for a visa status. Things are going quite well. And then I get called in for what I'm told is a final interview. Now, don't forget, I'm on the run here. You know, I'm wanted in the UK. I never turned up at court for my VAT hearing. So, or for sentencing for the cars. So, uh, I go to this interview, and one of the first questions is, you know, yeah, all this sort of stuff, and then they ask me if I've got a criminal record, or am I wanted? I say no, and the interview continues, and the question comes up again in another format. I say no again, and then it comes up again. Now, by this point, I'm thinking, what the fuck? This doesn't sound right. And then I notice two of the biggest security guards I've seen in my life come in behind me, and I get asked the question again. This time I just turn and go, I think you know the answer to that. I'm arrested and I'm sent to Niagara Detention Centre. Now initially I have the chance to uh, fight this. I can get my crimes dealt with in Canada. But I'm going to be in prison for a long time over here while I'm dealing with this. So the other option is to accept deportation, which I do. My wife at the time packs up and goes back to Scotland. And I get sent to Toronto West 1, which is a shithole. You don't see daylight at all. You're lucky if you get 10 minutes exercise a week. It is a very unpleasant prison. Anyway, I'm locked up with a guy on a technicality, a mass murderer, and a cop killer. A very interesting room we were in. Um... And then eventually comes my day for deportation. Now, you're supposed to, you're in an orange jumpsuit, you're shackled top and bottom, and you get taken to the airport. You're supposed to be taken into customs, changed in civilian codes, checked onto the plane, handed over to customs officials within the departure lounge, and then you put on the plane. When you get off the plane at the other end, you're technically a three person. It's down for the country that you're being deported to to re-arrest you. But no. That didn't happen for me. They marched me up to the check-in desk in my orange jumpsuit with top and bottom shackles chained up to the bugger. Looked like someone had a chain gun. And I remember when I was checking in, there was a woman, obviously quite well-to-do, middle-aged, very nervously looking at me. I'm then allowed into customs when I get changed. I'm then handed over to passport control. And I then enter the departure lounge. When I board the plane, I'm put in a middle row at the back, the whole row to myself. And again, this woman is at the end of the row in the aisle seats, looking at me rather nervously. We land, I get given my paperwork, I get off, I walk down to passport control, and there's six armed police officers there. One of them's walking up and down the line, and he stops next to me. So I step out of line, I hand him my passport, and I explain to him that I think he's looking for me. I'm immediately arrested and handcuffed. Now I've got luggage, so I'm taken down to the carousel where this woman is there again. And by this point, she's just about having a nuclear meltdown. She's just been on a plane with a guy who's huge, bald head, been in an orange jumpsuit and chained up to the belts to get on the plane, and then has got off the plane and has an armed escort with six armed police to collect his luggage. 
God knows who she thought she'd flown on that plane with, but she was a very nervous bunny. Anyway, I go to the local police station, spend a couple of weeks there because of a crowd in the prisons, and then eventually I go to court. And I'm sentenced for four and a half years. We were expecting six to 12 months. So that was a bit of a shock. Oh, I've missed something out. I'm good this is a practice run because I'll put this in now. December the 17th, prior to me going to um, the uh, interview, I'm working on my mate's low rider in my garage. It's up on jack stands. And one of the jack stands give way and I'll crush the truck. Full size Chevy lands on top of me. Starts crushing me. Uh, it's me pinned and it's going across my back. I remember pissing myself. I remember starting to shit myself. And all this time, a friend who I'm working with is panicking. He can't get a jack in against me because the jack's underneath the truck with me. Um, at first, obviously, I panic. I can't breathe. Then, I start thinking, shit, this must look funny as fuck. My big fat ass and legs sticking out from under this thing. Now, apparently, at this point, I'm starting to fit. Uh, and I'm just losing everything. <clears throat> but I do remember thinking... I can't be found dead under this truck having shit myself. I refuse to let that happen. Uh, and it just, it seemed comi comical. And then I remember thinking, God, I can't die this close to Christmas. The wife will kill me. Um, and then I remember being struck in the side of the ribs. But what I didn't know is at this point, he's trying to get, a, he's found another jack. He's trying to get it under the truck. And then I remember a complete serenity. Peace. Calmness. Most peaceful feeling I've ever had. My life didn't flash before my eyes or anything stupid like that. But I did did get this almost closing tunnel and pure calmness. And then nothing. And then I remember coming round um, having been dragged out from underneath the truck. Subsequently went to hospital. Uh, what I didn't know was that basically my eyes were blood red, uh, my lips were black, my nose was black, my forehead was black, my cheeks were black, from bruising. Uh, literally, it was like someone had tried popping me as a grape. Um, went to hospital, got checked out, didn't have insurance, couldn't really afford anything, so I discharged myself, and uh, I was told there was no damage, but I was in a huge amount of pain. Anyway, about two, three weeks later, I was doing a bit of work with a local gas company, catching on. I went back to work. I lasted about three hours, and I literally went white and passed out. Went back into hospital. Uh, I'd broken five ribs, uh, two of which they think he'd done with the trolley jack, and I'd shattered my sternum. Yeah, completely just shattered across. Um... It was a year before I could lay on my back and put my arms up above me and do anything. Uh, and it altered the way I walked permanently. I didn't get physio. Uh, and it altered the way I sold my hips and the way I walked permanently. Uh, so anyway, we fast forward. Obviously, that was um, a very... That, was a turn, that, that point made me really assess my life. Made me really assess what I was doing, where I was, and what a fucking joke my life was. I needed to start facing up the shit. I needed to start sorting my shit out. And the first thing I needed to do was deal with this criminality, or at least legitimise myself in Canada, which was one of the reasons that the, the, the catalyst that formed this attempt to be legalised. Um, so, subsequently... I've been arrested, I've been deported, I've now been arrested back at the UK, I've gone to court and I'm now in prison and I'm facing four and a half years. And I spoke to my family, I spoke to my kids, um, and I don't care who you are, I don't care how fucking hard you are, that first night in prison when you come back from court and you're facing four and a half years. Your ass just goes. Prison's easy if you've got nothing on the outside. But if you've got any sort of intelligence or any sort of life, 
that removal from society, that initial hit is hard. You adapt, you go into routines, you get used to things, you make the best of the situation. But just not being able to pick the phone up or speak to somebody, just not being able to, you know, have a coffee when you want, a cup of tea when you want. And trust me, that welcome pack you get, the coffee that they put in that, I don't know what the fuck that is, but that is not coffee. That is free dyed fucking cow shit. It is vile. And you, you, your life's not your own. I remember um, originally I was in Marshgate in Doncaster, that wasn't a bad prison. Uh, and then I was sentenced and I was sent to Armour. Uh, and I, the first few nights I was in with a, a heroin addict. And I remember waking up with my blankets being stolen and all my tea bags being used because he was going for a cold turkey, the little twat. They then moved me and put me in with another lad who was a smoker. And I kept asking to be moved out because I didn't smoke. And uh, eventually I got one of the screws and I said, look, why aren't I being moved? And he turned around because you're the first person who's not fucking battered. Well, that was pleasant. So you stuck me in here because you thought I stood a chance of sticking up for him when he kicked off. Great, thanks, guys. Anyway, sentence moved on. It gives you a lot of time to think, a lot of time to look at yourself. I knew I had to sort the relationship situation out. I knew I had to end it. And I knew I had to make amends with my daughter. I was, whether she would see me or not was immaterial. I had to do something because I had to start facing myself. And though the sentence was a lot more than we expected, the way I saw it was, it was a great leveler. It wrote a a line under everything I'd done. And therefore, I could start again. So that's what I started to do. Um, I worked through my prison sentence. Uh, I eventually moved up to Scotland. I did see who is now my ex-wife um, and my son again. Uh, and, um, you know, I just got on with it best I could. I tried to be a positive individual and I started thinking that I, needed, I wanted to make my life count for something now. Money wasn't such a driving factor, though I still like the trappings of life. Who doesn't? I wanted my life to count for something. And I wanted to be accountable for my life. And I needed to face who I was. And I needed to accept who I was. And that was hard. I did four and a half years of my four and a half sentence. And that took a long time to face who I'd become, who I'd been, and what I'd done. But to face it in a way where I could accept it for what it was. doesn't mean I was happy with it or proud about it or I thought it was right or anything like that. I knew it was wrong. But I could at least accept that I'd done it. And there was no excuses. There was no denial. It just was what it was. Anyway. Uh, we move forward. Um, yeah, I settled in. And that's just how it was. I moved on, I got up to Scotland, I went to open prison up at Scotland. Uh, and I got home late. And I went to the house that my wife and kids were living in. And what a shit all. I want to put fucking dogs in there. And I blame myself. Um, hated it. Hated it. So, though I knew I had to deal with a relationship, I also knew I had to deal with this. So when I was released, I uh, concentrated on... Uh, getting them into a decent place. I uh, managed to get a bit of work with a friend of mine, and uh, then eventually we moved down to Carlisle. Um, and then I, I got the opportunity to open a gym, which I did. It was never particularly successful. Uh, it managed, but it was always struggling. Uh, didn't help that my partner, my wife at the time, spent money like it was going out of fucking fashion. Um, our relationship was irreparably broken at this point uh, so she starts making up health issues to try and keep me around and 
I'm carrying a lot of guilt. I'm carrying a lot of guilt for what I did with my daughter and my daughter's mother. Um, but slowly but surely, I start to sort my shit. And then out of the blue, my daughter gets in touch. Um, didn't know what to think. Panicked. Uh, but I spoke to her. Uh, and then eventually, I spoke to her mother. Uh, I went down and saw my daughter. And I was expecting the front door to be open and my face to be greeted with a fucking frying pan. It was what I deserved at the end of the day. But she didn't. She talked to me. She said she felt sorry for me. She said she saw a broken man when she opened the door. But one thing became very apparent. God, I love this woman. I always had done. I just had lied to myself about it. Denied it. And this timing couldn't have been any fucking worse. You know, I'm trying to deal with the shit I've got up my own doorstep and sort that out. And now there's a woman in front of me who I absolutely adore. Anyway, spent some time with my daughter. And eventually, I leave my wife. I move back to my hometown, intentionally moving in with my mother. But it doesn't actually happen. Um, I end up moving in with my daughter's mother. Now, we're honest. Completely honest. I'm completely honest. She... You know, she throws at me what I've done. And I, I, I sit there and I take it and I'm telling her, yeah, you're right, I am. I'm scum. I'm well aware of what I am. I'd faced all this in prison. I knew who I was now. I knew what I'd done. I still had some issues. I still had some time to deal with things and, and um, acceptance and, and, and not letting the guilt eat me up. Because just accepting who you are and what you've done is one thing. Controlling the guilt is another. And the guilt had made me make a lot of bad decisions for a lot of my life. Um, so, you know, I was finally starting to put things straight. Unfortunately, um, my wife, who I left, um, wasn't too happy about it, even though the relationship had been very broken for a very long time. Uh, and she told my son a lot of things that, that did damage my relationship with him. I've stayed honest and true, but uh, I can't help it when you're surrounded by poison. So, um, here I am. New relationship, but an old relationship, but a very honest relationship. And this is the start of me rebuilding my life. And the key to that was honesty. Honesty with myself, honesty with people around them acceptance for who I was and then the decision about whether I wanted to change that or not and whether the workload to change that was worth it I still felt a little lost um, I still felt like I needed to achieve uh, and that was part of the driving factor behind UC1 and UC2 having been through those I no longer feel any urge I am very very comfortable with myself I'm very aware of what I am I'm very aware of my faults and those that I feel weren't change or that I desire to change I work towards changing but none of this is possible without being honest none of this is possible without first facing yourself I am happy there are things in my life that are still shit I don't see my son which is fucking shit my son has a perception of me that is not true, which is also fucking shit. My daughter is a shit. Uh, she drives me insane, and she's made some very bad choices in her life. But I still love her dearly. Um, but you know what? I am actually happy. I am very happy. I have a wonderful relationship because it's built on honesty. It's built on us being true to each other. We not lie. We're not instagram people we're not fake profile pictures we're not i have a friend whose missus is never seen without makeup no one's seen her without makeup. i don't think he's even seen her without makeup we're completely honest we're really honest about our failings we're honest about our problems we're honest with each other we had to be the only way this relationship was ever work from what had gone on in the past was complete and total honesty and that has built such a solid foundation and such a strong relationship that that trend continues now.
you know, I, I'm, I've gone completely off this script, by the way. Uh, this is just coming straight out now. You know, the you want to be happy. You want to be successful. It starts with honesty. You can be successful without honesty. There are plenty of liars. Look at any fucking politician who make a shitload of money. But you won't be happy. You will lie to yourself for being happy. And you'll hide in the trappings of that success. But you won't be happy until you accept yourself. And once you accept yourself, then you can start to improve the person you are. If you so desire. And then it becomes a simple ratio. Is the perceived pleasure I'll get out of achieving that worth the perceived workload I think it's going to take to achieve that? Which is why I don't compete. Because I don't think it's fucking worth it for me. But if something is, I'll give it 110%. There's a lot more to being positive in someone's life than there is to having money in the bank. Trust me. Had both. Been a millionaire. And I've been homeless. And you know something? There was a simple honesty and peace and happiness almost about the homelessness that wasn't present with the money. We are all a product of the decisions we make. And we can sit here and make any bullshit excuses we want. It's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of no, it's because we choose to do so. Nobody forces us to do anything. We choose. And therefore, we must choose to accept the responsibility of that choice. We make excuses or oh, it's because oh, it's because that's when no. It's because either you weren't strong enough, you didn't work hard enough, or you didn't want it enough to achieve it in the first place. Because we can achieve anything you set your mind to to some degree if you're willing to put the work in. I've said this for a very long time. Do not set limits. Find them. You will always achieve more than you think is capable if you believe. And we are all capable of such amazing things if we put enough work in to achieve them. But there is a balance as well. There's no point working towards something if it doesn't make you a better person or a more content person or a happier person in one way or another. Some people get pleasure out of helping others. They work the bollocks off for everybody else because that actually gives them the pleasure. The raiders, the helpers, it's, it's the nature of them. There's nothing wrong with focusing on you. Being selfish is not a negative thing. It just means that you concentrate on yourself for a period of time. And sometimes that's what you need to do. But we can all achieve so much if we are just honest about who we are where we are and what is needed to do it there is no substitute for hard work unfortunately but that hard work can be enjoyable and that hard work that journey is part of the pleasure of that achievement you know it's part of the process that makes it enjoyable there are always going to be shitty bits of our life and shitty days and shitty people it's just part of what happens and the world is full of a lot of shitty people these days but just because wrong is done to you doesn't mean you need to do it to them most people don't set out to harm others or to wrong others most people set out to do something for themselves and don't think of the fallout or the potential damage to those around them that was always my issue I damaged people around me because I pursued certain things in certain ways and I wasn't particularly careful about the people around me. But I never actually set out to hurt those people, which is why I was with this conflict of guilt. Um, but, you know, if we're honest about who we are and where we are, which is very hard to do. I mean, it took me over four and a half years in prison to even start this. Then we can start to move forward because we're not lying to ourselves. And we all do it. 
we all lie about things what we do that we know we shouldn't really do or we know are not going to be productive and what we're planning to do fucking we all lie but the more honest we can be with ourselves the more true of a reflection we have of ourselves the more chance we have of being successful achieving our goals and dreams and being happy and no amount of money in the world will replace that I never knew happiness on the level that I now enjoy was possible. And even on the shittiest, darkest, crappiest day, I'm happy. Because I'm at one with me. And I have a partner who truly loves me and who I truly love because it's based on honesty. No secrets. However difficult and hard they have been to come out, they have come out and the result of that is a strength that I've never felt or endured or had the pleasure of sharing before in my life you can be whatever you want to be okay you're not going to turn into a tree if you're a human being fair enough so you're not going to be a tree but you know in all reality you can achieve amazing and wonderful things if you just believe and you're honest You're honest about where you are. You're honest about where you want to go. And you're honest about the work you're willing to do. Because if you're not willing to do the work, you will not achieve. And so many of us lie about our achievements. Fucking post it all to Facebook and Instagram. Work hard, play hard, new car, paid cash, and it's financed. Oh, it's not even yours. Fake Rolex watches. Fake bullshit, fake that. Who fucking cares? You can have all the cars and jewellery in the world. It makes no fucking difference when you're in the ground. What measures a man when he's in his ground is his reputation and what others say about him. And if you can shuffle off your mortal coil, having people's respect, then you've done a pretty damn good job of being a human being. Right. An hour and seven minutes and I've completely fucked my script. Never mind. Very nervously, I'm going to put this up there. Uh, so, it'll be interesting to see what you guys think. Shitting myself on this one. But we'll see. I miss shitloads out. Um, so, I'll probably have to do another one. But we'll see. Okay. Uh, be gentle, eh? <laughs> but be honest. Because it's, I don't want smoke blowing on my ass. If it's shit, you tell me it's fucking shit. If you take nothing from it, tell me you take nothing from it. And I'll relook at it. Okay, thank you, and I'll speak to you soon.